Good morning, everyone. And thanks for being with us today for this time of worship, encouraging one another, and fellowship. It is good to be with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Want to remind you, this week is when we will be having the uh, celebration of life ceremony for Carl Grebe. That is going to take place this Wednesday. From 1 to 3 p.m. will be the visitation, then, and it will be at the country church. And then at 3 p.m. will be when the celebration of life begins. And then after that, we will have military honors to follow, and that will be at the Bremen Cemetery. So mark that down, keep that in your mind. It'll be good to be there um, to show support for Jolene, for one. You know, she still has much to go through and process herself, and just a good way to show our uh, love and care and memory of dear brother Carl. Let's open up this service with a word of prayer and just asking God to remove from us any distractions so that we can tune our hearts, our souls into worshiping him through the songs that we sing and the word that we hear. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, prayerful that you would fill us with your spirit, direct our minds to worship you. Help us, Lord, to cast aside at this moment all of our concerns and our worries and our burdens, to just bring them to you in prayer and then trust that you will answer those things in your good and perfect will. And then just rest in you this morning, worshiping you, through the songs that we sing. Lord, you are such a good God, so mighty, so beautiful, so gracious, kind, and caring. We thank you, Lord, for all the many graces and mercies that you give us day after day. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day and for this time that we have to worship you and sing songs of praise to you. We pray that it would be pleasing in your sight. God, we ask as we Go into your word this morning that you would guide us into your truth, helping to lead us and instruct us in the way that we should go to more faithfully obey you, to bring uh, joy to our lives as we live in the light and in life, and to bring joy to your heart as we worship you through what we do. God, we love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Well, welcome again. Trust you all had a good week, and we've got a couple, old, I call them old hymns of the church to start out with, so please join us.
interesting little aside, that song exists in Chinese. You couldn't hear it, but my wife over there was singing it in Chinese this morning. I, I think I sang that before in China, in Chinese, but I can't really remember it. Fun idea, maybe sometime uh, when Jenny and I are feeling better, we can sing that as a special. Jenny's like, oh dear. Or we could just play a video. Uh, that might be better, because our will never sound like an actual Chinese person would sing that song. That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful and to, to think about, although we don't often think about the fact that, you know, there are people in all kinds of different countries, all kinds of different ethnicities, all kinds of different languages that are worshiping God, uh, sometimes in their own songs, songs that we don't know at all, and then sometimes in songs that we do know, but sounding quite a bit different from how we would sing them. Uh, you know, this is Sunday morning, not here, but in many parts of the world. In China, I guess this is what, now Sunday night. So when we were sleeping, they would have been worshiping over in China and other parts of the world. But on Sunday, believers all around the world are worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. And Chinese people sing that same song. It's kind of neat. So we are uh, nearly done with our series on apologetics and evangelism. This lesson, I think, is going to be a shorter one. I always think that, and I get chatty, and it goes longer than I anticipated. But um, to me, it's one of those points that are I feel well understood. I feel even um, people who are not believers understand the importance of children, um, how easily reached they are, how important it is to reach them for shaping the generation that is to come. We uh, Christians have long had various children ministries. We have a variety of children's ministries here at the Country Church, not the least of which is preschool, where we're able to reach them from a very young age with the truth. So I, I think that this is a point that is you know, well known, well understood, not a lot that will be surprising here, but there may be a few surprises, and it will just help to if nothing else, to get our focus once again a little bit more toward children who are a very important age group for us as believers to reach. So let's open with a word of prayer and then find out why we should be making children a priority. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and Lord, we do ask that you would speak to us this morning. Help us, Lord, to cherish children as you cherish them, to value them as you value them, to speak truth to them when it is most important for them to hear truth. Help us, Lord, to be people who introduce young ones to you, God, from an early age so that their development would take place with truth and a centeredness on your gospel and on you that from a young age, more and more people in our country, our community, would know you. And so by knowing you, live richer and fuller lives and avoid uh, common pitfalls that can happen. Lord, thank you for children and the joy they are in our lives. Just their, their tender hearts, their curiosity, their interesting perspective on things. Lord, we pray you help us to love them as you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. So I went online to see if I could find a percentage, rough percentage, of when people first trust in Christ as their Savior. And I have long understood and known that the majority of people do come to faith in Christ when they are in their childhood years. Now, when I was looking this up online, um, I found a variety of percentages. And even this morning, I was looking a little bit more and found a variety of percentages. Depending on who is running the test, how they run the test, you'll get some variance and the time it was and all of that. But 
Uh, it seems to be about an average of only 15%-ish are, are saved after their childhood years. Like once they reach about the age of 19, you see a significant drop off in the number of children who are saved. This study, which uh, you probably can't see the numbers very well, maybe you can depending on where you are. This study was conducted by a group called ministrytochildren.com. It's a decent one, but something I didn't like about it was all of their questions were toward people who are in ministry, which, you know, there's a lot of other believers who are not in ministry, so you're missing quite a significant chunk of people there. But it's fairly new, and it was from 2019, and they found basically that around 16% of people are saved after adulthood. So the majority of that little circle there are people aged uh, around 2 to 18 years of age. Now, a group that uh, they're really professionals at research, they're known for research, they're the Barner Research Group. I found uh, good information from them, but it's a little bit dated. This comes from 2004, and they had some, some information on this subject too. They found that 43% of Americans who accept Jesus as their Savior do so before the age of 13. So that's close to half of people who become Christians do it before they reach their teenage years. Then 64% made that commitment before they were 18. So Barna's, um, Barna's study has a significantly higher amount of people being saved in adulthood than this more recent one. But the point, I think, is still made. 23, whether it's 23% or 16% are saved in adulthood, you see a definite minority of people being saved in their adult years. And then 13% trust in Christ between the ages of 18 to 21 years they found in this study. And again, this is from 2004. I would, I would say, certainly, as time has gone on, it's expected, believable, that this, this number from 2004 that was at 23% would be closer to 16%, which is what uh, that other study found. So again, most trust in Christ when they are children. Some other interesting findings from Barna which we will uh, see and apply later as we talk about this. One, this I found really remarkable and also beautiful. This is wonderful to hear and read, is that 50% of those who were saved before they were 13 were led to Christ by their parents. That's wonderful uh, just to hear so many uh, parents involved in their children's life in this way and children trusting in this way. Then there was another 25% who were led to Christ by a friend or by a relative. 13% were led to Christ at a special event. 7% were led to Christ by a minister. Then 1% were led to Christ through media evangelism. Again, this is from 2004. I would guess as technology has taken off that that 1% is probably going to be higher now. Also, that doesn't add up to 100%. Uh, but the article that I was re reading, that's all it referenced. So I'm not sure where the other percent came from. Maybe their own personal Bible reading or something like that is accounting for the rest of uh, that percentage. But yeah, remarkable. You're looking at about 75% of, of people, say before the age of 13, it's through a close relationship, either a parent or a relative or a friend. And close to a quarter are saved more from a, a church kind of activity, either a minister giving a sermon or maybe a summer camp or youth group event or something like this, are children being saved. And this is saved before 13. They had data. I didn't want to overwhelm you with it, but they have data from the, the teenage years too. And it starts to shift a little bit, as you would kind of anticipate. You know how kids are when they hit 14, so many kids, or I don't want to listen to mommy and daddy anymore. So of course the numbers there will start to shift away from parents and toward events or toward, toward kids or media evangelism. But that's, that's what Barna found up to the age of 13. Another few interesting points. Christians converted before their teen years are more likely to 
say that they are absolutely committed to Christianity. More likely, Christians converted from ages 13 to 21 are less likely to call themselves deeply spiritual. And then Christians converted in adulthood are more likely to believe that Christians and Muslims believe in the same God. I want to stress that this is statistics. You know, I know plenty of people, a lot of people, who don't fall in line with these statistics. Uh, I have seen individuals saved in adulthood, saved from gang life, saved from all kinds of terrible things, who go on to become sold-out ministers of the gospel, um, just really, really committed to the cause. And I've seen younger people who, who are saved and have been genuinely saved who drift off as they get older. Um, that, that happens a lot, too. These are just statistics. But it's important to recognize them in helping us uh, understand why we should be making children a priority. So the conclusion from this research and other research, and we're going to bring the Bible into it soon because its opinion is without error and most important of all, but the conclusion from this very good research is that people are more likely to become Christians when they are kids, and they are also more likely to have a stronger relationship with God if they were saved as children. And so, you know, point made, we can go home now. We should be making children a priority because we want to see people saved, and we want to see people have a strong relationship with God. And statistics are showing that the younger that we're able to reach somebody, the more likely we are to see both of these things develop in somebody's life. Jesus said this in Mark 10 in response to a situation. I'm going to read a little bit more of it than I have here. I couldn't fit it all on a screen. I'll, I'll read from verse 13. Mark 10 verse 13 and follows says, And they were bringing children to him, that's Jesus, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Here in these verses and some others, we're going to see some reasons why biblically, why children should be a priority target for us as believers. Why are most saved before adulthood? Well, from what Jesus just said when little children were coming to him, and he said to such belong the kingdom of God, we can gain this inference. When kids were coming to Jesus, he said that to such belongs the kingdom of God. He's implying that children being saved is the norm and also the ideal. These children who are coming to him and the kind of faith that they are coming to him with, the without reservation, the innocent trust kind of faith, is normal, it's healthy, and ex an example of what uh, genuine salvation looks like. So don't, don't hinder these children from coming to me, Jesus says. So we get from Jesus' own statement here, we gather that uh, it's normal, it's healthy, there's an ideal, there's an example seen in children coming to Jesus. Then Jesus also said that our reception of the kingdom of God must be like that of a child, which this must have really been mind-blowing to these original disciples. Um, children were not, they weren't really valued like they are today. They were seen, I mean, today they're still seen this way sometimes as just a nuisance uh, I think a lot of them didn't really believe that a child even could be saved. So this was kind of a radical thing for them to, to hear uh, a strong rebuke where Jesus is reordering things a little bit. And instead of saying, hey, the, the kids need to be like the adults, he's more saying, hey, the adults need to be more like the kids in their faith because the way the kids are coming to me, what they are showing, that's, that's the kind of genuine faith that leads to people being in the kingdom of God. The majority of our formation occurs when we are children. So this is just one kind of naturalistic way of viewing things, of looking at things. You know, if you're here and you're an adult, once you reach adulthood, 
you don't, you don't like to change. And uh, even if you do like change, it can be very hard to do it. Um, any kind of change that is brought about in your life often comes with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears once you reach adulthood because you've got years of, um, of doing it a certain way, of thinking a certain way, and it's often just so challenging to, to change when you're an adult. Uh, when we are children, though, we are being formed. We are learning. Uh, we're taking in the, the world around us, beginning to form our, our world view. And so many events and things that happen go on to influence and shape who we become as adults. Another major reason is children have less baggage and have formulated less objections to Christianity. We're going to see um, there's a story that takes place right after Jesus says this to his disciples that I think is linked because we're going to see an adult who has formulated some baggage that he doesn't want to let go of and he rejects Christ because of it. But children, they're a lot less complicated. You know, sometimes talking to different adults about accepting Christ as Savior, you can hear all kinds of things. Uh, my mom has a good friend that she's tried for a long time to win her to, to Christ. And for some reason, this friend thinks that Emperor Constantine wrote the Bible. You're like, I don't know. You, but you're not going to run into a child. Well, you might if their parents told them. But in general, children are not going to be saying things like, Emperor Constantine wrote the Bible and, all Christians are hypocrites, and this sort, this sort of thing isn't often something that the children have quite developed yet and carried into their life like a lot of adults have. Uh, there's less on the line for children when they make that decision. You know, when you're an adult, <clears throat> talking in your, your 40s, it's a little bit harder to announce to the world, I become a Christian, than it is when you are eight years old. Um, you've you formulated a lifestyle, um, a place that you're working, friends, and, and it just is gonna, it's gonna be a bigger step, a bigger thing to say when you become an adult. And you're gonna be considering those things more than you were when you're a child. Uh, children, young children are a lot less likely to be thinking about what are my peers gonna say about, is this gonna be cool? Um, am I going to, not be able to enjoy the same sins that I enjoyed before. Considerations like these are, are a lot less common in children. And then adults don't change much, as I said. So now there's, um, backing this up, link to this, there's a story that takes place right after Jesus says this. And just like everything else in the Bible, things are put where they are for a reason. And I think it was not an accident that this took place right afterwards because we can see Kind of an illustration from these verses of a guy who does not come to Christ as a child would. So verse 17, right after, right after the children come, and he says, don't hinder them. As he, Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So, notice this takes place, these are right beside each other, this takes place right after the children are coming to Jesus. The children and they're coming to Jesus, they are not uh, talking about wealth, and they're not idolizing it as being more important than Jesus and their time with him. The children, they come to Christ without reservation. They come to him, trusting in him. But the adult, he fails to come because he wants his possessions more than he wants eternal life. Looking at uh, how children are, looking at how adults are, contrasting these two examples, how the children come to Jesus versus this adult who backs away from Jesus, uh, we see that this is why apologetics and evangelism tend to be both harder and less fruitful when geared toward adults. 
with adults, we need apologetics because uh, they have built up these different things that they have against the faith. So we find ourselves having to learn to answer this question or that question about this science thing or this history thing um, because they have reservations and apologetics helps to tear down those walls. But with children, it's a lot less likely that we are going to encounter these sorts of things. Uh, With adults, you have issues centered on money, what their peers think, what's happening at their work, the beliefs they've developed over the years, what their lifestyle is like, their reputation being on the line, the things they love, the things they hate, the sins they want to cling on to. All of these have taken deep root. This is not to say that they can't be saved. Let's, let's read on. This is neat. Verse 23, it says, And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Adults do get saved. In in fact, it's always a miracle when somebody gets saved. When it's a child who gets saved, when it's an adult who gets saved, it just takes a little bit more of a miracle, we'll put it that way, for an adult to be saved because of all the, the stuff they've often built up. But God is working miracles every day and saving despite these things. And it's, it's amazing as we come alongside somebody and love them and speak truth to them how these things can work. You know, we've seen and heard before of individuals who have all these different objections, but then when something happens in their life, um, God's been working on their heart over time, and they eventually will come and trust in Him. Have, do you know of anybody that you've just been surprised to see come to Christ the Savior? I've had people... My life. There was a kid growing up who bullied me a lot. And I remember looking online at Facebook one time and seeing him as a recommend, and I clicked on him, and he had become a believer. And he was a genuine Christian, really passionate about it. And if you had asked me, I would have thought, no, he can't. He's not going not to trust in Christ. He's a mean guy. God can save anybody. But for, you know, for reasons uh, we can't fully understand, he is just often saving people younger. And I'm glad for that because the younger people are saved, the less likely they are to make a lot of mistakes that people regret, the more they get to enjoy life as God has intended it. Okay, so what should we do about this? You know, we know whatever the percentage is, whether it's 23%, 24, 6, 15, we know most most adults are, are not saved. It's most children who are saved. And it tends to be they have stronger spiritual lives when they're saved as children. So what should we do about this? Now, this first one, okay, okay, I'm going to say it. I know I don't have any kids, all right? A little awkward, but I looked it up online, and truth is, the primary growth factor for Christianity is Christians having children. So, prayerfully consider having more children. But, you know, I'm talking to a lot of people who they are not going to be having any more children. I'm one who can't have children. There's other ways that we can uh, have more children. We can pursue adoption. We can pursue foster care. Uh, If 50% of children prior to the age of 13 are saved through the ministry of their parents or through the ministry of a relative or a close friend, then I think it needs prayerfully considered Uh, if God is calling you to perhaps have more children or to adopt or to pursue foster care. Now, you know, maybe you've considered that, maybe the stage in your life, it's not a thing. Uh, Sure, for most of us, it's not going to be a thing. But we still will have relationships with family, right? Uh, You will have nieces, you'll have nephews, you'll have grandkids. Tell them about Jesus. (laughs) Spend time with them because, again, These young people, they're the ones who are most likely to be saved. They are the ones who will be uh, most likely to have a strong relationship with God. And you will have relationships with other people who are in your family. You know, you can be the uncle or the aunt 
um, who is both cool and also a Christian, you know, who loves this child, who hangs out with this child, spends time with them, and be a positive influence in their life in that way. You'll have grandkids. Uh, your kids will, will drop the kid off over to your house. You can spoil them with candy and also tell them about Jesus while you're at it. Uh, just look at family members as a ministry outlet and tell them about Jesus. You can support or participate in an ongoing children's ministry, which we have uh, quite a few at the country church. You can look into and getting involved in. And there's also, you know, others outside of the country church, other ways that you can minister. Um, like Lakeland Child Evangelism Ministries is a separate organization, but certainly one that's very good, and there are others. Or you could even start a new children's ministry. You know, there's things that people have thought of that are just so creative and neat in order to reach children, uh, things that I would never have thought of or maybe can't even do myself because I'm not equipped to do. I found out months ago about this neat children's ministry called Dustin's Place. I think it's in Rochester. And it's for, say again? Plymouth. Okay, it's in Plymouth. Uh, and it's for grieving children. It's for grieving children. What, you know, what an awesome idea. Um, children who have maybe lost a loved one, who have been going through some hard time. It's just a special safe place for these children to be where these believers come alongside them and minister to them. You know, I, I don't know the different visions or skills that different people have at the country church, but if you're here and you're like, hey, I, I have this idea about starting like a sports groups for kids or some support group for kids, or some other thing that you think God is equipping you to do. I'd love to, to hear about that, because God can do uh, all kinds of things with unique ministry ideas. So, another consideration for you there. So, children should be a priority, and one way or the other, there's going to be children in your lives, whether it's your own child, whether it's a grandchild, a niece, nephew, whether you're teaching them, uh, whether you're part of a children's ministry, be praying about how you can show the love of Christ to them and how you can speak truth to them uh, because this is a great golden opportunity that you have uh, to lead someone to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, we pray that you would speak into our lives, revealing to us any children that you want us to be reaching with the gospel, be it our own, others. Lord, help us to be examples to them of how Christ is, showing them your love and truth, your steadfastness, your integrity. Help us, Lord, to speak truth to them in love and to be a light to these young people. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you're able, would you please stand with us?